Hi, this is Sherry Shabowski, and today we're going to talk about the digestive system. We'll start with the function of the digestive system. Well, it takes in food, breaks it down, waters it down, turns it into energy-rich molecules, absor absorbs the fluids and nutrients, and then sends out the waste. Simple, right? Okay, all done. Nope, I think we're going to go a little bit deeper than that. The GI tract mechanically and chemically breaks down food into its nutrient components, which are proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Seeing, smelling, or tasting food triggers the cephalic phase of digestion. Your brain is intimately involved in digestion. Let's talk in more detail about the cephalic phase of digestion. All right, it'll start with the cerebral phase. When you think of food, smell, or taste food, your cerebral cortex is involved. The cerebral phase initiates the digestive process. Salivation is triggered. The vagus nerve stimulates the release of gastrin from G cells in the stomach. Wait, let's just pause right there for a minute. I like to revel when things are named like what they are in medicine. That is so rare, but here we have gastrin coming out of G cells. Just thought I'd have you take note. All right. The vagus nerve stimulates the release of gastrin from G cells in the stomach. Gastric secretions respond. Gastrin is a hormone which is released into the blood and impacts target organs such as the stomach, where it causes the release of hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. 20% of stomach acid accumulates before food even gets to the stomach. Now the stomach is ready for the meal. This component of digestion is conditional. As an example, depression can inhibit this component of digestion. Sometimes when people are depressed, they can look at the, their favorite food on earth and it just won't make a difference. Take a look at your next meal. Some will be psyched. Vegans, maybe not so much. Saliva is going to water down that food. That saliva comes from the exocrine salivary glands. The mouth breaks down the food and waters it down, grabbing up some sugars along the way and preparing it to move down the digestive tract. To be a bit more specific, digestion begins in the mouth. It starts when the teeth grind and cut food so that it can be swallowed easily. Your tongue places the food on, food on the molars to improve contact for grinding. Chemical digestion begins here in the mouth. The body cells need glucose to make the energy they need to function. Salivary enzymes initiate the digestion of starches in the mouth. Salivary amylase is an enzyme found in saliva that plays a crucial role in the initial digestion of carbohydrates. You make approximately 2 liters of saliva a day. The saliva begins the chemical digestion but it also does much more. It lubricates the food bolus, making it easier to swallow. It stimulates the taste buds so you can enjoy your meal. And if that wasn't enough, saliva has a protective effect on your teeth. All right, when chemical and mechanical digestion is complete, your tongue sends the food down the hatch. As anyone who has ever laughed while drinking knows, Fluids can go up into the nose or sneak into your trachea, causing you to cough and sputter. This isn't great for fluids to go into either of these areas unexpectedly, but it would be a disaster if your macaroni and cheese wound up in your sinuses or your trachea. Food needs a little directional assistance to keep that from happening. Thank goodness for these guys. The uvula points the food in the right direction and blocks passage into the nose. The job of the epiglottis is to keep food out of the airway. Acts like a bouncer. Now it's time for the food to ride the saliva wave down the esophagus to the stomach with a little push from peristalsis. The GI tract is surrounded by two muscular layers arranged in longitudinal and circular pattern. Alternating contraction and relaxation of these muscles pushes the food bolus forward. As the food bolus enters the esophagus, peristalsis begins. This triggers the stomach to relax so it can accommodate the meal that's coming down. 
fully contracted and empty, the stomach is approximately the size of a fist. And as anyone who enjoys Thanksgiving or orders pizza knows, that size just isn't going to cut it. So receptive relaxation is necessary if you want to enjoy Thanksgiving or game night. Let's stay focused on the stomach. The stomach relaxes and gastric secretions are released before the meal arrives, but secretions continue while the food is in the stomach. In the case of chemical digestion, hydrochloric acid breaks down proteins and activates enzymes. Pepsin breaks down proteins and activates enzymes as well. Pepsin clips the protein bonds to form smaller polypeptides and amino acids from the protein that's in the food. Mechanical digestion is the result of muscular churning, kind of like when your stomach growls. The stomach is the only part of the digestive tract that adds a third layer of muscle. The whole GI tract has longitudinal and circular muscles that facilitate peristalsis, keeping everything moving in one direction. The stomach has a third layer, the oblique muscle layer. This is because even though the food is chewed, it still needs to be completely broken down into liquid so that the nutrients can be absorbed easily in the next phase. The churning motion that is facilitated by the three muscular layers turns all particulate matter into liquid chyme. If particulate matter larger than two millimeters reaches the pylorus, it is thrown back into the body of the stomach for further churning. Mechanical digestion ends in the stomach, so it has to be done right. Now, I definitely believe that this is what happens, and it does make sense. But clearly, like all things in medicine, there are always exceptions. Like, for instance, corn. I will pause for a moment to let you think that through, but not too long or you might get grossed out and distracted. All right, acidic chyme coming in hot. The pH of the cauldron of hydrochloric acid in the stomach is 1.5 to 3.5. You may or may not know that the body and blood, with few exceptions, functions best at a pH between 7.35 and 7.45. Well, then why don't the digestive enzymes and stomach acid destroy the stomach and the small intestine? That's because they have protection. These guys don't look like much at first glance, but they are in charge of gut protection. Mr. Mucus lines the GI tract, especially the stomach, preventing autodigestion. In the colon, it protects the gut against invasion from the microbiome. Bicarb floods into the small intestinal zone before the acidic chyme arrives to neutralize the acid as soon as it comes in. These guys do a great job. Now the chyme is in the small intestine and chemical digestion kicks in in earnest. Paracelsus rolls the chyme around so all the nutrients can be in contact with the digestive enzymes. The accessory organs of the GI tract contribute enzymes that break it all down and then the small intestine absorbs the nutrients. The liver, gallbladder, and pancreas play a big role in the digestion of chyme. The liver makes bile, and the gallbladder concentrates it and squirts bile into the small intestine when the stomach contents move in. Bile emulsifies fat into small missiles. Much like when you shake up your oil and vinegar dressing. This gives the pancreatic enzymes more surface area to break down the necessary fats. The pancreas is an endocrine and exocrine organ. The endocrine component manages blood sugar by releasing hormones into the blood. It keeps blood sugar balanced and opens a door in the cell membranes that allows glucose to move into the cells when a meal arrives. The exocrine component dumps enzymes directly into the small intestine. These enzymes break down the three major nutrients. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates, protease, breaks down protein, and lipase breaks down fat. Many of the enzymes are released in a non-active form, and they are activated in the small intestine. This keeps the pancreas from digesting itself. 
The duodenum, duodenum is the first segment of the small intestine. The duodenum makes its own digestive juices, including the hormones secretin, cholecystokinin, which is CCK, gastric inhibitory peptide, GIP, motilin, and somatostatin. On the brush border, or cilia, of the epithelial layer, there are digestive enzymes that come in contact with the chyme as it sloshes around and around by way of peristalsis. Some of these enzymes include exopeptides and endopeptides, maltase, sucrase, and lactase. Probably are more familiar with lactase than you know. It converts lactose into glucose and galactose. A majority of Middle Eastern and Asian populations lack this enzyme. This enzyme also decreases with age. Lactose intolerance is often a common abdominal complaint in the Middle Eastern, Asian, and older populations, manifesting with bloating, abdominal pain, and osmotic diarrhea. Not great. Then it's time to collect the nutrients. Absorb, 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 absorb. The small intestine is not just a tube. It has some pretty interesting architecture. The small intestine is pretty long, about 22 feet or 7 meters. But a lot of absorbing has to go on in the short time the chyme is in transit. Therefore, the small intestine is not just a tube. The tubular structure is covered in villi that, protect into the, that project into the lumen, increasing the epithelial surface area of the tube dramatically. Each of the villi are covered with microvilli that further increases the epithelial surface area to an astounding 30 square meters or 320 square feet, thereby maximizing the opportunity for the absorption of nutrients. The remaining undigested material, along with water, passes from the small intestine through the ileocecal valve into the large intestine which is colonized by 500 to 1,000 different types of bacteria in numbers estimated as 38 trillion. Yeah. The large intestine absorbs electrolytes and some vitamins and lots of water, which turns the liquid chyme into solid stool. Stool has little value by the time it makes it through the large intestine, so out the poop chute it goes. Going back to the beginning, remember the overview of the gastrointestinal tract. It turns food into energy. It undergoes mechanical and chemical breakdown, absorption of nutrients and water that the body needs, and then expulsion of the rest. Now that you have an overview of the basics, it will be much easier to fill in the details later on. Here about a little added bonus here. How about a clinical correlation? Let's go. The GI tract is designed as a one-way system, in the mouth and out the butthole. But people have a habit of ingesting all kinds of noxious things. How does the GI tract protect itself? Well, the constant flushing of fluid through the system helps to keep the pipes relatively clean. The mucus layer and tight junctions between cells in the epithelium keep potential bad actors from entering the bloodstream. But truly noxious substances are sensed by the brain early on. When your bitter taste buds taste something noxious, it sends information to the brain, telling it to eject that poison. If noxious material is absorbed, it may circulate in the blood. There's a spot in the brain near the fourth ventricle which samples blood regularly, and if it detects something noxious, that information goes straight to the chemoreceptor trigger zone, also known as the area postrema, which causes you to send the nastiest nastiness right back out. Some call this the vomit center. Interestingly, when there is blood in the left ventricle or pressure on that area postrema, it also induces vomiting. All right, back to the ejection of noxious material. Sometimes, the puke just does not get rid of the body get rid the body of noxious material. Sometimes it doesn't work. 
be it poison or infectious agent, there must be a backup if the puke can't remove everything. I will spare you the illustration of the diarrhea which flushes the system quickly to save you from serious contamination. So the next time you have diarrhea, think twice about grabbing for the KO pectate. Let your body rid itself of the poison before you try to slow it down. One more tidbit. Babies and toddlers vomit frequently compared to the elderly. In the case of the youngest of humans, if they vomit once or twice, it's usually no big deal. But if the elderly vomit, it is almost always something serious. Want to test that theory? Ask three to five people over the age of 60 when was the last time they vomited. Odds are they were either in the hospital or simply cannot remember because it's been so long. Did this conversation make you hungry? Want to grab some lunch or take a quiz? Well, it's hard to provide lunch through video, so I guess I'm going to go with quiz. If you walked into your house and smelled bread baking in the oven, what would happen in your GI tract? You would salivate, and your brain would tell your G cells to produce gastrin, which would tell your stomach to start secreting hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. Or do you hate bread? Perhaps you heard some devastating news on the way home from work. In either case, you would be a statistical outlier. So no cephalic phase for you. What is the difference between mechanical and chemical digestion? Here I have them grouped. Mechanical digestion includes chewing, the saliva slide, peristalsis, and stomach churning. Chemical digestion includes salivary enzymes, hydrochloric acid, pepsin, pancreatic enzymes, and enzymes on the small intestinal wall, and bile. What is so interesting about the architecture of the small intestine? As microanatomy goes, microvilli on villi increases the surface area of the 22-foot tube to 320 square feet. Tight junctions and mucus keep pathogens from entering the bloodstream. But how about if I give you an anatomy bonus? How does 22 feet of small intestine smashed into your peritoneal cavity keep from getting twisted or kinked? Well, the small intestine has a mesentery, which makes it all fit together like a fan when it's closed. See the pictures. First, this is the type of fan I'm talking about. Second, the lower picture shows you small intestine on top with the mesentery connecting it. And the top right picture shows you how the medicine terry folds up like a fan. That picture is minus the small intestine, which would, have, which would have obscured that picture. So just you get the idea, much like a fan. So the small intestine has a mesentery, which makes it all fit together like a fan when it's closed. The longest edge of the open fan is the small intestine. The body of the fan is the mesentery, seen in the upper picture without the small intestine attached. You can definitely see how it looks like a small fan, right? Or excuse me, a closed fan. The very base of the fan is the single point where all the mesentery is fixed to a point in the back of the peritoneal cavity. There you go. I really appreciate you taking the time to learn with me. This was an overview of the function and mechanics of the GI tract. We covered the anatomy, microanatomy, and physiology with a little bit of pathophys and endocrine thrown in. I hope you feel like you have a good basic understanding of how digestion works. Once you have the concepts in your head, it's much easier to fill in the details. Best of luck with your studies. If you'd like to hear the whole series of organ system lectures, send me your email. I would also greatly appreciate it if you would fill out a very brief survey about this approach to learning. Thank you so much for listening, and hopefully we will meet again in the future. Bye for now.